Hello, everyone. So um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Christian um, Benkammer. If I pronounce it correctly. So Christian is from um, Medical University of Graz uh, in Austria. Yeah, in Austria. <laughs> so uh, he received his PhD in biomedical engineering from Graz University of Technology in 2012. His research focuses on uh, studying the uh, pathological ion de de deposition in using quantitative MRI method in MS, ALS, and Alzheimer's disease. Um, recently, he's performing studies um, trying to uh, post using postmortem MRI to better understand, uh, to validate his finding and to better understand the underlying biophysical mechanisms. So today, I think I believe he's going to show us more of his recent work to um, using postmortem MRI to study tissue uh, composition and microstructure. So welcome. Yes. Thank you for the introduction. I have no conflict of interest to declare. Uh, yeah, this work is about post-mortem MRI. And actually, I'm working in a clinical department of neurology, so mainly dealing with MS and Alzheimer's. And somehow, I slided into this topic of post-mortem MRI. At the very first glance, um, it did not seem very appealing to me. But after a while, I recognized there are some things uh, doable uh, with a postmortem setup which uh, can be used for validate your measurements. So forensic imaging is one of the first images of uh, x-ray of a cadaver a year, two years after the invention of x-rays. So people are interested in studying forensic issues. And forensic imaging, the good thing is we have a non-invasive technique and we can reconstruct accidents and the main, the most important is that the images are available later. So if there are new questions arising in court during the process, these images can be reviewed another time, especially focusing on other questions. Um, clinical forensic imaging is dealing with living persons which have been uh, suffered from a violent or sexual uh, assault and provides internal findings. But as there in forensic imaging, so post-mortem imaging, this is one image from uh, the New England Journal of Medicine and it shows four types of hemorrhages. And these hemorrhages here, these hemorrhages here, this is a, a medical point of view. You see the hemorrhages, where are they, and what to do, how to treat the patient best. The forensic view on this image would focus on this additional hemorrhage outside the brain and the direction of the impact. So forensic view would give us insight about how uh, did this accident happen. So the question is, is imaging uh, a tool only to answer forensic questions? In a normal setup, the forensic department asks the biomedical imaging department to make some images of a specific region of a postmortem um, cadaver. And the imaging department provides those X-ray, CT, or MRI scans. Actually, I think the more than 90% of, of all images provided are X-ray and, and CAT scans because just of the availability and the uh, simple interpretation of this comparison with MRI. However, it would be beneficial to have also more interaction. So the imaging guys ask the forensic department to provide them tissue for validating. This is a, I will provide some examples later. Uh, one article of, of Shana Wardloff recently pointed out that postmortem MRI is underused. That's definite. I will try to give you some useful examples and you can judge about the importance to your work. How did I end up doing postmortem MRI? This is uh, kind of a basic, uh, of a personal introduction now. The brain iron is unevenly distributed. 
and there are several structures accumulating iron in the brain and like in deep brain matter structures there's also an effect of aging and people like Bert Rohr recognize there's a correspondence between this uh, pearl staining for iron and T2 weighted MR images and since this Manslon work a variety of different methods have been proposed and all those methods share a common component sensitivity to iron in some way. So the goal of my work was to figure out of, of these available techniques which is the most accurate and sensitive method to assess brain iron and oops. and apart from being the best technique it should be also applicable in, in feasible time in clinics and cover the entire brain. What possibilities are there in general to, to validate or to look for sensitivity? One can make, make simulations or look in literature then use an indirect approach as shown with this age dependency but these indirect approaches they require quite big sample sizes neonate imaging also doable for, for myelin not and iron validated in molecular imaging setup but we decided to do it in a post-mortem setup and this talk will cover ex situ MRI so the extracted brain in situ MRI the brain inside an intact cadaver and give you some applications ex situ MRI so the MRI takes place directly after autopsy and applications would be the identification of hallmarks like lesions and validation when extracting a brain it's deformed obviously and to prevent this deformation of brain it can be stabilized we use the uh, agarose uh, for stabilize the brain or here the brain slice to increase the stiffness and traditionally we vacuum this brain slice within the agarose to uh, increase the stiffness additionally and to protect it for, from outer impacts. When scanning an entire brain it becomes more complicated so we put in this device here you see it's uh, all embedded in agarose then it's scanned and this setup allows us to cut the brain in one centimeter slices we have these ceramic sticks here which are for stabilizing stabilization and these allow to cut the brain in one centimeter slices afterwards these slices are put into those trays, plastic trays and scanned again and from this scan uh, one can see here white matter hyperintensities which cannot be seen here on the on the brain tissue directly so this scans help us to to find radiological issues and to correspond them with the brain registration is quite crucial in this context and uh, I want to stress that if the registration is not be done very carefully there's almost no you're almost lost to find the corresponding tissue position uh, afterwards these tissue samples undergo histological or chemical analysis also genetics or proteomic analysis problems with this ex situ MRI is the formation of air bubbles. We have apart from these big air bubbles in the 
ventricles, we also have small air bubbles which are locally disturbing our MR signal. And depending on the se sequence, these artifacts become more or less severe. For example, here this diffusion sequence, it's almost unusable unus like all EPI-based sequences in uh, XC2 MRI. How can we reduct these artifacts from air by, by uh, vibration and by pressuring? And traditionally, by using fluorinated fluids, which uh, have a high density and a low viscosity, which can be added to the, <coughs> which are surrounding the scan tissue. Formerly in fixation, this is the 90% plus case of post-bottom scans. You get some tissue from a brain bank or from some collaborator. This tissue is formalin fixed, and formalin fixation in, in formaldehyde in the PPS is cross linking proteins and stopping the autolysis. Compared with this fresh tissue, the fixed, formalin fixed tissue is more rigid and also changed its color. MRI of, of formal fixed tissue allows us to scan in very high resolutions. There's no movement, there's no float, uh, and the scan time is virtually unlimited, and also the structural details remain intact. So it's useful, but however, comes with a drawback of changing all or a lot of relaxation properties. T2, for example, during the process of formalin fixation, T2 is changing here in a negative way, then in a positive way. So T2 is changing during the process of, of uh, fixation, making interpretation harder. Also, there is a change of, of diffusion because the fixation essentially immobilizes the water, the free water proteins. And this work done here uh, shows that fiber tracking becomes or less fibers can be tracked in, in this fixed brain. This is an entire brain in, in formalin and uh, imaged it uh, during two months the, to monitor the process of formalin fixation. And you can see these uh, formalin bands, which are diffusing from the border to the center of the brain. So this process takes some time and when we look at, at this slice we can also nicely see it can be nicely seen that uh, the relaxation parameters of the tissue are changing. This is an MPH sequence and so uh, you see the basal ganglia are getting very bright after being fully fixed. Diffusion of formalin fixed tissue, almost impossible because of this artifacts. Even when we go to higher resolutions, like with this segmented EPI sequence, it's not possible to get uh, entire brain image, image without artifacts. Additionally, this fixation process lowers the SNR, and when Fusion images are put into a standard processing pipeline. Something happens like misregistrations and the oops, sorry, and the outcome. This FA maps are quite uh, noisy and not meaningful. So the solution to all these problems, solution to everything, is in situ postpartum MRI and. What now changed is that after the death, we do the MRI, and afterwards, the autopsy and the fixation process and the XC to MRI and the other processing takes place. So this is the change, and MRI directly after death done this setup 
uh, as such as shown here. Uh, logistics and uh, ethical considerations are more challenging than, than the MRI, so therefore we invest uh, at least six hours to scan the brain, only the brain, and it's covering all uh, quantitative sequences, diffusion, and experimental sequences. Then the autopsy takes place, the brain is fixed, and again, scanned. After scanning again, we do the dissection, and then extract tissue samples. And these tissue samples are either used for histo histology or for mass spectrometry, as it is useful for looking for metals, iron, manganese, uh, also calcium, it's interesting. And also, we do squid susceptometry with this brain tissue. I want to stress again, documentation is one of the most important things when doing these correlation studies. Otherwise, it's really quite impossible to register brain tissue from the, the position of the extraction to the MR image. So, in vivo, uh, in, in situ, MRI solved lot, lots of problems, like there's no formation of air bubbles. It's, it's quite similar from the uh, geometric shape of the brain to in vivo. But there's one thing which has to be considered and this is temperature dependence and there is a T1 and diffusivity dependence on temperature which has been shown by uh, Tofts and colleagues and this is a flare image oh, this is a flare image uh, with uh, standard inversion time of 2.5 seconds and flare essentially is a T1 filter so when we go from temperature down to 10 degrees, it changes the inversion time, and we end up with this image. One could adapt the inversion time to get images which are known from uh, in vivo. Yes. There is not much information about temperature dependence in literature, surprisingly little, and main most studies have been done at the CSF and there's also no information about T2, T2 star and MTR and susceptibility in an experimental setup. Also we ask is there structural dependency so gray, does gray matter have another temperature coefficient as white matter? Intuitively I would say yes, because there's a different uh, water content in gray and in white matter, so this T1 dependence should be leading to a different temperature coefficient. Furthermore, we were interested in uh, what happens in the proximity of iron and myelinated structures. For this, we use the setup as shown before, but put this embedded and vacuum stabilized brain slices into the sphere and cooled and heated it within the scanner after the cooling or heating process after the temperature is stabilized we scanned this and this is one example a T1 uh, from the T1 inversion recovery sequence and want to point your attention over here the basal ganglia can be delineated from the surrounding white matter, whereas here at 8 degrees Celsius it becomes more or less equal from signal intensity. Why is that? We're looking at the result. This is for T1, the temperature dependency. One can see that those uh, tissue types, white matter, cortex, basal ganglia, uh, have different coefficients and at very low temperatures the contrast of those tissues is lost. So we found this and, and also this reference is now allow 
correction for corpses with different temperature to compare them and comparison with in vivo conditions. Ongoing work is, is focusing on, on diffusivity, uh, spectroscopy and formalin fixation because there should be also the same temperature effects. So, um, application. To come back to this question about uh, the brain iron, what's the most sensitive method to measure brain iron? Uh, we may investigated this chemically in seven subjects, and these are the obtained chemical iron concentrations, and they are very good in line with the results from uh, Halgren's study 50 years ago. And then, what Halgren not uh, was uh, Halgren could not provide, uh, obviously, a, a comparison with MRI. But we had the MRIs, therefore, and compared it with R2 and R2 star mapping, and found a good linear correlation with R2 and an even better, better one with R2 star. So R2 star seems to be a very good measure for brain iron. And this is an individual assessment of the basal ganglia. So on the left side, there's approximately 15% more iron than on the right side, and this is also reflected in the brightness of this R2 star map, also here. So, we found a very good correlation, but when we're looking only at white matter, this correlation, the sensitivity is about three times lower than for, for gray matter. And you ask, why is that? Why is the sensitivity lower for white matter? And in, in the following studies, we showed that the susceptibilities of iron and myelin are counteracting. So the white matter myelin is counteracting and, and lowering the sensitivity of the measurements. This is why iron is paramagnetic, myelin diamagnetic. And additionally, there's an orientation dependency so white matter fibers uh, do not only change R to star, but also phase and susceptibility when uh, put into different angles in respect to the main magnetic field, as shown by this study by Cherubini. Another open question was the origin of this very pronounced phase contrast from gradient echo sequences, so there's almost no magnitude contrast here, but here in the face we have a very high contrast between gray and white matter, and it was unclear whether it's iron, myelin, or something else, so we set out to investigate uh, this and take iron uh, sample or tissue samples from this cortical and subcortical regions. And at the end, it turned out that the iron is not responsible, or not mainly responsible for this contrast. It's the myelin. The iron is way too, too uh, the variation of iron is too little. And this also shows why the relaxation rates are positive, whereas the susceptibility and the phase shift is converse from a direction, and therefore we have almost no contrast here, this, is this example, and a huge contrast on the face images. Uh, finalizing this iron topic, I want to mention this quantitative susceptibility mapping. This is an extension of the previous shown work, corrected for temperature and also uh, iron is uh, heavily impacting the susceptibility. Also with this drawback that in, in white matter the uh, sensitivity is lower. So how can we assess iron in white matter? By modeling the susceptibility and relaxation rates, including the iron measurements from the uh, mass spectrometry using the fiber orientation and the myelin content. 
And the myelin content here is the thing um, which has to be determined, uh, which is not quite easy to determine. And this leads me to the next topic, the, the determination of, of myelin content and fiber orientation. But uh, another uh, study was done on the corpus callosum because there we do not have this orientation effects. So all the corpus callosal fibers are orthogonal to the main magnetic field. And we dissected this corpus callosum, found this distribution of iron there, and that iron and myelin are additively uh, contributing to R2 star relaxation rates. Ongoing work is focusing on histology. So myelin. To measure iron in white matter, we have to be we have to know more about myelin and fiber orientation. So diffusion comes into role. Two X C2 examples. This is unfixed. This is fixed, formally fixed, and there are air artifacts, there are deformations, there's slow S and R. So X C2 cannot be used, and when we compare an ex situ uh, diffusion weighted image with an in situ MRI, you can see that it's much better, much closer to in vivo conditions. Um, the patient or the subject's data, which I will show here, is has this this white uh, this white rims surrounding the ventricles. And first we thought it's a temperature effect, but it turned out that this patient was 92 years old and they uh, have this um, pencil thin lining of the ventricles, which is uh, T2 uh, hyperintensity. So this is not related to temperature effects. And from the diffusion MRI, Tactography can be done, and also fiber tracking. We have to compensate the lower brain temperature with higher B values. Normally, 1,000 is used. Here, we used uh, 1,500 to 2,000 to compensate the lower temperature, but can also go higher with the B value. So this is the single-shot EPI. With, almost, with no movement and no flow, you can go to, to higher resolutions using segmented EPI or other uh, high-res DTI techniques. And there are several benefits. Apart from the higher resolution, the artifacts become less pronounced and more uh, structural details become visible. Um, then uh, we, we went uh, higher from the resolution to 0.5 millimeter in plane and these are these images of the segmented EPI with an amazing uh, detail of, of structure. This is a F, these are FA maps of these diffusion weighted images and they are quite noisy. However, I have to point out that the setup was not perfect in this case because we used the 12 channel receive head coil, only six directions and one average lasting eight minutes minutes. So it was only a test scan. Test this this uh, segmented EPI sequence and in future work we will should increase the resolution and averages to get uh, improved diffusion images. So now we have these very nice uh, diffusion images and there are several measures which could be validated. And the main question is how is DTI, what is a, a DTI and QSI telling us about multiple fiber crossings and more general what are the underlying biophysical mechanisms of those diffusion measures. 
to look for tractography, uh, one con could manually trace tractographic uh, fibers with tweezers after crystallization, and this leads to the knowledge of the uh, tract, like in here. However, uh, one is somehow restricted when we have fiber crossings, like here, it's not cannot be seen very well where's the main direction of the fibers, whether it's this direction or coming from here. So, and applying this with the tweezers, it's just, it's just not telling us where the fibers go. It becomes undetermined, but orthogonal structures can be uh, traced quite well. This is a very nice technique to improve your anatomical skills about the brain, but maybe you have heard about a better way, this polarized light imaging, uh, proposed by AXA some years ago, HBM, and this polarized light images, imaging leads to, on the very right, and this uh, directional maps, which are very related to the uh, color-coded anisotropic maps of diffusion tensor imaging. This is one technique, challenging from setup. Another one, very elegant, very simple, is structure tensor light imaging, where a histologic stain is uh, microscoped. And this is one example, and after some post-processing, one obtains the orientation, the anisotropy, and brightness. And this is a, a histologic image and the correspond corresponding fiber directions. So these were three techniques where we can assess the fiber directions in brain slices However, the, the main drawback of them are the use of thin slices and the loss of the three-dimensional information because it's all those three are projection methods. And thicker slices would enable a more elegant, more straightforward way to validate these diffusion measures, and we could also use confocal microscopy. Thicker slices require transparent tissue, and some weeks ago, uh, this technique entitled Clarity was presented, which essentially is making brain tissue transparent by substituting the lipids. And these transparent brains can be sliced, uh, can be imaged with microscopy and giving us these amazing images with high level of detail. So this technique just has been proposed. We try to, uh, to clean the tissue another way, this uh, optical clearing method. Uh, colleague well, is interested in, in uh, imaging the aorta and he cleared the aorta, making it transparent for light. So this uh, tissue here, this then can, can be imaged with multi-photon microscopy and to show you the results of the aortic imaging uh, with an amazing level of detail, you can get uh, more than one millimeter in depth, and this is the water with quite thick uh, collagen fibers, and also it gives us three-dimensional information, and here, this is a slice taken from this region one, and not, o not only gives us the information about the fibers, more importantly, it shows fiber crossings. So this technique would be wonderful to apply on brain tissue to investigate the fiber crossings there. And we're currently in the process of 
of uh, imaging brain tissue. Good. Um, now back to the topic of myelin. The, there are several markers for the for the myelin content or density, including magnetization transfer, FA bound bull fraction, myelin water fraction, and it's more or less unknown how specific they are for the myelin content. So ways to, to get more information about the myelin content will include proteomic profiling and lipid analysis to get uh, profiles of the lipids and proteomes included in myelinated white matter and to relate them to the MR measures shown before. Yeah, with this application, I want to conclude with take home message, the closer at in vivo conditions, the easier your life becomes because you don't have to deal with formalin fixation with this ex vivo, ex situ artifacts like air bubbles, temperature. So in situ imaging is preferable. It's challenging. One should correct for temperature effects and also be careful in the proximity of vessels with uh, the oxygenated blood. I've shown uh, some applications for validation of MRI measures for the identification of the of pathologic expressions and most interesting from a physical point of view uh, to provide more insights about the biophysical mechanisms which provide us these fancy MRI images. I want to thank my group and, and people who helped in this postmortem studies and thank you for your attention. <laughs>